Hi everyone, welcome to the rooftops of Oxford University, specifically the rooftops of Jesus College, one of the 39 colleges at the university. My name is Matt Williams, I am a fellow and tutor in politics here at the college. I'm also what's known as the Access Fellow, meaning that I am responsible for making the university and its colleges more accessible to people that have historically been underrepresented at the university. So is the University of Oxford overrated? Well, in a word, yes, I think it often is. But if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll explain a couple of important Important ways in which the university is commonly underrated that actually make it a very special place. But let's have a consideration about the question, you know, what, what does it mean to overrate a certain place, to give it a reputation, even a degree of notoriety that it perhaps doesn't fully deserve? Well, where does that reputation come from? Well, the University of Oxford is commonly listed as one of, if not sometimes, the best university in the world and it's important to understand what that means and I'll explain a little bit further what that means later. It's also had some very notable former students, we've educated half of all British Prime Ministers, we've educated 13 saints, uh, we've educated or worked with more Nobel Prize winners in science than France and Belgium put together. So this is a place that has an extraordinary academic reputation stretching back 900 years so it's also the oldest university in the english-speaking world and as you can hopefully see even on this fairly gray december morning it's quite beautiful as well but to my mind none of that stuff actually hugely matters to individuals thinking of applying to the university now let's talk quite specifically about whether or not it is one of the best universities in the world well, it is commonly ranked as such, but of course you'll probably notice that different university ranking systems rank universities differently. And that's because, of course, they use different criteria. And that raises a crucial point about university assessment, which is that there's a big dollop of subjectivity about it. In other words, a huge amount of what goes in to forming those rankings depends on the priorities of the people doing the ranking. And that's crucial for you as well. If you're trying to select a university to study at, you need to think very carefully about what is important to you as an individual, not just what might be important to other commentators on universities. I mean, the reason that Oxford is often highly ranked is because it has quite a high research output, has a lot of research income, it has some fantastic facilities. Now, these things can be of importance to prospective undergraduate and graduate students. But if it doesn't teach a subject that you want to be taught, and if it doesn't teach it in a way that you want to be taught, and if it's not in a location that you want to live in, then it's clearly not the world's best university for you. In fact, it's not even a good university for you. And so what I'm saying here is that you need to trust yourself. You need to come up with your own university ranking and be happy with it and understand that the most important things that we're looking for are individuals that are really passionate about the subjects that we offer and the subjects we offer are highly academic and they will suit a lot of people but they won't suit everyone and if they don't suit you that's okay that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you in the slightest so we need to be a bit more sort of careful about how we describe the world's good better and best universities and we need to think very carefully about what it is that we as individuals are looking for. And also, you know, things like notable alumni, I mean, that really doesn't matter. I mean, I've been working at Oxford for over 10 years, teaching and working in access. And just because we've educated 13 saints and multiple kings and whatnot, doesn't mean that I'm any closer to canonization or coronation, does it? You know, it just does not matter in the slightest if the university has had those famous alumni. So these sorts of aspects of reputation just simply don't matter a great deal. And we need to be careful in how to assess them. Okay, now why would I be saying this, right? I'm supposed to be encouraging applications. I'm supposed to be trying to sort of make you feel like you want to come and study here and feel empowered to do so. Well, the reason for saying it is because I think a lot of people apply to universities like Oxford for the wrong reasons. They apply because it's got this sort of fantasy wonderland look about it and because it's got all of these sort of famous people that have studied here over 900 years and that people want to be a part of that. But what we're looking for or individuals that are going to contribute to the society of academics that are working to solve contemporary problems now. We're not particularly interested in those that are applying because they are interested in some very famous person that may have studied here hundreds of years ago, because that's not relevant to our admissions processes. 
It's also a problem, I think, having a very high reputation for university because it puts a lot of people off. It's a bit like saying to someone, oh, you're thinking of going out with the most good looking person that has ever existed, right? It's incredibly intimidating. And not unreasonably, a lot of people just get put off. They think, oh God, well, they wouldn't be interested in me. Oxford's surely not gonna be a place for somebody like me. And that's just likely to be wrong in many cases, especially if you are absolutely committed and fascinated by a particular subject, because that's what we're looking for. People that love their subject, that would happily read around their subject without having to be told to do so because simply they care about it. That's what we care about ourselves. I love politics. I would happily read about politics on Christmas Day uh, and any other sort of national holiday because I love it. It's, some, it's a tawdry, ridiculous soap opera. It's, it's Love Island with nuclear weapons, as I tell my incoming students. So that's what we're looking for, is people that have a real sort of thirst, a real passion for their subject. So I'm not trying to put you off applying for Oxford. I'm not trying to say that its reputation is entirely undeserved. But I think we just need to be careful as to what actually matters when it comes to choosing universities and what, frankly, is just complete irrelevant fluff, such as how many saints we taught. OK, so do think very carefully about things like that. All right. Now, what aspects of Oxford do I think are chronically underrated? And indeed, actually, this applies equally to the University of Cambridge. There are two special features of the two universities, sometimes called Oxbridge collectively that are not often very well understood. The first of which is how we teach. Both universities teach in incredibly small groups called in Oxford tutorials and in Cambridge supervisions. They're the same thing, but they just have a different name. And what they are is that it is very small group teaching. So when I teach tutorials in politics here at Jesus College, my class sizes are never larger than three students. In fact, for the most part, they're two students. So two students and me having a conversation for an hour every week for the whole Term. And it doesn't matter what subject you're studying for here at Oxford, you will have similarly small classes very regularly. So medicine, physics, maths, computer science, law, material science, engineering, it doesn't matter. You will have these small tutorials, usually twice a week as an undergraduate, for the whole of your degree. Now, the reason that this is unusual is because it's a magnificently, magnificently inefficient way to run a university, right? We could double or triple our class sizes, save ourselves a small fortune. But it is our money that we're investing in this. So we don't charge any higher tuition fees to British students than any of the other prestigious universities in the United Kingdom, the so-called Russell Group. So the tuition fees for Oxford are the same as they are for the University of Manchester, Imperial College, Cardiff University and so on. And yet you get a lot more bang for your buck because you'll be taught in such tiny classes. And because of that, we can take you further and faster through the material than most other universities will be capable of. Okay, so that is an unusual, that is a special feature of the University of Oxford and Cambridge. They do exactly the same over there. Now, even though it's inefficient, it is I hope you can understand magnificently effective. The other thing that's special about the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge uh, is connected to the first thing, which is that we have the money to pay for such extraordinary teaching and for fantastic facilities and resources. Because Oxford University has been around for 900 years, it's been squirreling money away and it can now invest that money in tuition and it can help students, even students that are coming from incredibly poor uh, and otherwise disadvantaged backgrounds. So your wealth, if you're a, a, a British citizen, uh, is not a barrier to studying here. We have had people who've come directly from homelessness to study here. We've had refugees come and study here. For international students, there are also lots of generous scholarships and bursaries available. So that's another unusual feature, which I think most people don't fully understand. They think that Oxford is a sort of playground for rich, snobby elites, but that's not the case. It's actually never really been the case. Uh, that is a part of the, sort of the notoriety and the myth of Oxford that also could do with just fading away and dying, frankly, um, that we are very happy to help and we have the capability to help to a greater extent than other universities are. So that's another special feature. But why did I choose to come to Oxford? Well, frankly, I chose because I believed in all the hype. You know, when I first came uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I came because I wanted a part of that 
power, that sort of excitement. And I can understand that intoxication. So the reason for me sort of sharing these insights with you now is not to sort of say that you're completely wrong if you feel those ways. It, you know, if, you, if you're applying to Oxford because it's famous, because it's in lots of films, because it's got that sort of, I don't know, pizzazz and prestige about it. What I'm trying to say is that try and concentrate on what actually matters because you could end up actually doing yourself a bit of harm. You might sort of apply to the university and again, a bit like sort of trying to ask out this incredibly attractive person. It's so intimidating. And if you get knocked back, you could be sort of crushed by it because you feel like you're somehow not good enough. But the only things that really matter about this university are the people, frankly. I mean, so I've highlighted a couple of special features about the university but honestly the thing once you strip away all the layers that really matters about the University of Oxford are the people. This is an agglomeration of some magnificently talented, committed, kind, hard-working people that have contributed to solving many of mankind's problems and are looking for more such people to help us solve future problems. So that's what we're looking for and that's what we would encourage you to think about when choosing a university. Oxford is fantastic for many people but it's just not right for everyone and that doesn't mean that you're any less of a person just because you might not fit the University of Oxford. So in summary I think the University of Oxford is commonly overrated but only because a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate what's really special what really matters about the University and actually what we should be overrating, or actually so just rating accurately, are the way we teach here at Oxford, the capacity and the willingness we have to support people financially if they need it, and the people. The people are what make any institution. And the reason that this university has been enduring for nine centuries is not because of the old buildings, it's because there have been generation upon generation of people that have been committed to solving humanity's problems, teaching to the highest level and allowing people to develop their skills to solve whatever problems they want in their life. OK, I hope that makes sense. I hope that's useful. Please consider subscribing when I'll explain why we even have colleges like this one here, Jesus College and various other naughty aspects of the Oxford uh, and Cambridge admissions process. And I look forward to hearing from you in the comments. If you have any questions, do feel free to submit them and I'll endeavor to answer them all. Thanks so much for watching. All best wishes. Bye now.